Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U online instruction. Hello again. We're back for the third lecture in the first week of this course called Fundamentals in Atomic Force Microscopy. And what we're going to do in this particular lecture is we're going to start to estimate quantitatively the strength of various uh, electrostatic interactions between ions and molecules and molecules and molecules, one with respect to another. We're going to start to develop physical models where you can actually calculate the strength of these interactions. So. Uh, possibly the best way to begin this is to remind you that <clears throat> when you took your introductory course in electrostatics, uh, you probably only discussed three, uh, uh, three different types of charges. Uh, certainly everyone discussed the interaction between point charges. This gives rise to, I mean, this, this interaction between two point charges is described very well by Coulomb's law. Um, if you took a course, maybe at an advanced level, you discussed uh, surface charge distributions and volume charge distributions and how those surfaces that were charged interacted one with respect to another, or how volume charge distributions interacted one with respect to another. That's often a topic that's, that's considered. Um, very often the interaction between dipoles, whether they're permanent or induced, uh, very often those, uh, those interactions are not, not considered uh, carefully in introductory classes. But yet those are the forces, those are the interactions that give rise to these forces between an atomic force microscope tip and the substrate. So we have to build some intuition, we have to do some confidence building examples uh, to remind you uh, uh, what the laws of electrostatics say about those interactions. So we're going to basically, in this lecture, we're going to focus on the, the three items in this table that are uh, colored a light orange. And I just give some, uh, some examples of, uh, of, of molecules that, uh, that are characterized by these, these different uh, uh, words, right? So we have to be able to associate the words with the physical model. And, and I try to do that in this particular slide. I'd also like to remind you again, this is a central concept, this electrostatic potential energy. Uh, very often it's easy to calculate in one dimension where motion is only in the, in the, in the Z direction, for instance. But it's a completely general concept and it applies to charges that can be oriented or can be assembled in three dimensions. And in this particular case, I give the, uh, the, uh, the um, relevant electrostatic potential energies, the formulas. I give the formulas for the relevant electrostatic potential energies in three dimensions. We're now, we're not just interested in one coordinate, but we're interested in the position R. So these formulas are useful to know, and they, re they often just require a simple derivative, partial derivative of, of the potential energy function with respect to X, Y, and Z in order to identify the relevant forces that act in the X, Y, and Z directions. And that's indicated, uh, I, I hope, in the, very clearly in the, in the last uh, uh, equation on this slide. <clears throat> By way of notation, I try to use uh, the symbols a small i, small j, and small k to represent unit vectors in the X, Y, and Z direction. I think this is common notation, but uh, there are certainly other choices that can be made. But throughout these lectures, I, I will try to stick to the i, j, and k uh, unit vector notation. Just a couple of real simple examples. The first example just illustrates what happens if you embed two point charges. These, these point charges could be like ions, the lithium and the chlorine atom. Uh, you embed them in a material that has a dielectric constant kappa, right? The electrostatic potential energy of these two ions are going to depend on the separation distance uh, between them. Uh, the electrostatic potential energy varies uh, one over the separation distance. You can take the derivative of that electrostatic potential energy with respect to the separation variable, uh, 
multiply it by minus one and you'll get the net force of interaction between these two ions in this, in this particular dielectric medium. <clears throat> the situation uh, is, is the, 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 the nice thing about electrostatic potential energies is that they're additive. So if you have a system of charges, let's say Q1, Q2, and Q3, that are placed inside of a dielectric medium. Dielectric medium has a, a, a dielectric constant kappa. Then the net interaction potential energy of those three charges can be, um, can be found by summing up piecewise the interaction potential energy of each charge with its neighbors. And, and, I, and I write the particular formula at the bottom of the slide. Uh, again, the potential energy of interaction is lowered by the dielectric constant kappa. The dielectric constant kappa is a number that's measured experimentally. It's always greater than one. And, uh, and that has to be put into the calculation depending on what the intervening, intervening medium is that these charges happen to be embedded in. The other thing I wanted to mention is that the sign of the uh, final answer depends uh, not only on the separation between the charges, uh, those are the parameters, uh, the radial parameters that are listed in this diagram, but they also depend on the polarity of the charges Q1, Q2, and Q3. So when you evaluate this expression, you have to put in whether Q1 or Q2 or Q3 are positive or negative, and then you have to do the algebra uh, associated with that substitution. This can make you <coughs> electrostatic, either a positive or negative number, and whether it's a positive or negative number has a lot to say about whether the assembly of these charges is, is stable or unstable. So uh, again, that's something that you have to put into any uh, uh, problem associated with this uh, assembly of, of point charges. <clears throat> We'd like to uh, extend the discussion to dipole moments and to just sort of focus the discussion, uh, I just, first of all, uh, have copied and pasted some uh, molecular structures of a few uh, well-known uh, dipoles, or a few well-known molecules. These molecules uh, are either polar or nonpolar, and I'll, I'll tell you which are which in the next uh, slide, but these are the... Uh, uh, the, the physical structure of these molecules. Uh, some of them are, are quite complicated. Um, it's a fair question to ask, and students in physics uh, do this a lot because we don't, we're not so familiar with the chemistry, but I mean, experimentally, how would you identify whether any of these molecules that I've listed in the previous slide, how would you identify whether they're polar or nonpolar? <coughs> the simple way to do that is the way the, the, the field started hundreds of years ago. Uh, you basically take the liquid of interest, put it into a, a, a tube and, and let it drip out the tube. Uh, you then bring up a charged rod that's been charged with some power supply. If the uh, liquid is attracted toward the charged rod, it's probably a polar liquid. If the liquid is not attracted towards the charged rod, it's probably a nonpolar liquid. So this is a very simple way to distinguish between dipolar and non-dipolar molecules. And <clears throat> it, <clears throat> it at least provides some physical basis for this classification that we're talking about. So the words mean something, and, and, and I tried to indicate in a very schematic way what those words are trying to convey to you. Um, what I've tried to do here is I've tried to collect together some relevant properties of a few common molecules. Uh, these particular molecules aren't uh, necessarily uh, important within the context of atomic force microscopy, but what I'm trying to um, convey in this table is that you basically need to know three, three parameters if you're going to uh, calculate the uh, uh, interaction forces between tips and substrates. And these three uh, parameters are basically the dielectric constant of, of the molecules that comprise either your tip or your substrate. You have to know what the dipole moment of those molecules might be. That's the parameter P. And then lastly, uh, 
there's a third parameter called the polarizability. This is a topic that we're going to discuss um, uh, in a couple lectures from now, but I, I include it in this table. So it's important to know these three parameters when discussing the interaction uh, uh, potential or the, the interaction forces between the, the tip and the substrate. Uh, very often this dielectric constant um, is used to classify whether a molecule is polar or nonpolar. Uh, it's a rule of thumb that if the dielectric constant is typically less than about 15, then it's considered a nonpolar molecule. If the dielectric constant is greater than 15, then it's clearly a polar molecule. Um, the other point I'll mention is that the dipole moment for these molecules does depend on whether the molecule is in the vapor or the liquid phase. So if you happen to find a reference or a textbook that uses uh, different values than the one I've listed here, uh, you have to you have to worry about what phase of of uh, uh, of the so of the material the the molecules comprise. So those are just a couple of things that um, that that I had to work through in putting this table together. So in terms of a broad overview of what we're going to consider, uh, we're basically going to try to systematically work through all the possible electrostatic interactions that, that can take place. And we're going to try to rank them in, ter in terms of strength, which is the strongest interaction, which is the weakest interaction. And the first set of interactions is basically one ion that interacts with another ion. It interacts with a polar molecule or it interacts with a nonpolar molecule. And uh, we're going to systematically consider these three interactions and we're going to develop physical models that allow you to calculate the strength of these interactions. So let's, let's start with the ion-ion interaction. This is the simplest case. Um, again, uh, this, this is basically an application of Coulomb's law. If we have two point ions, uh, one has a charge of plus one electron, the other has a charge of plus one electron in this particular case. Let's say the two ions are located uh, five nanometers apart in a liquid that happens to have a dielectric constant kappa equal to two, uh, what is the interaction potential energy that you might expect uh, for, this, um, for this system of, of two-point charges? So I work through, I work through the example uh, here. I, I give the answer both in terms of joules, which are, which are the standard set of units, and then I convert joules into electron volts because sometimes it's easier to consider electron volts. It's a more intuitive form of, of energy uh, unit. So the conversion between joules and electron volts is just the charge on an electron. It's 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. So as I've indicated in the third line of this slide, one electron volt is, one, is essentially 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. And so you can easily convert from joules to electron volts back and forth uh, using that, that fact. Um, it's also useful to consider the thermal energy that's uh, appropriate for any situation. Thermal energy can be estimated by simply multiplying Boltzmann's constant K, uh, K sub B in this case, times the temperature T in degrees Kelvin. So I, I calculate thermal energies KT, at, at room temperature, which is essentially 300 Kelvin. And what I find is that the thermal energies uh, are on the order of 0.03 electron volts, whereas the uh, Coulomb electrostatic interaction between these two ions separated five nanometers apart. Each ion has a charge of plus, plus one electron. Uh, that interaction energy is 0.14 electron volts. So the electrostatic interaction in this case is much stronger than the thermal interaction, and so the electrostatics is going to win, and it's going to dominate the, uh, the, uh, the, the motion or the interactions of, of these two charges. The thermal energies in this case are, are quite small. Uh, the, the next situation to worry about is how an ion interacts with molecules. And we have two cases to consider. One is a polar molecule, the other is a nonpolar molecule. So let's first consider the case of a polar molecule. So as we discussed in the previous lecture, right, a polar molecule uh, 
is a molecule in which, for whatever reason, the charges, the electronic charges inside the molecule separate. So for instance, the negative charge might, might be slightly uh, uh, localized on one end of the molecule that would make the other end of the molecule positively charged. We would then say that this molecule acquires a dipole moment P, which is just, give, which is just equal numerically to the charge that's separated times this distance d over which those charges separate. So you can take this electrically neutral molecule where the charges are now polarized, and you can replace that with an equivalent electric dipole. The equivalent electric dipole is indicated by this ball and stick figure. Okay, And, and then lastly, uh, that, that equivalent electric dipole can re be replaced schematically by a, a, a little arrow that points in the direction of the dipole moment. The little arrow is given the symbol P, and that P indicates the dipole moment of that particular molecule. So we won't we won't work through all these steps for every situation. We'll just we'll just jump to the end and we'll say there's a dipole moment that's oriented in let's say a dielectric. Uh, with a certain uh, dielectric constant, and we start to ask questions about how that dipole moment interacts with other dipole moments. But physically, what's, what's going on is this sequence where you systematically separate the charge, define the, di the equivalent electric dipole moment, and then calculate, uh, calculate that moment in a very simple way by the, the formula that's, that's featured in the center of this, this particular slide. So if, if, we, if we try to systematically look at ion dipole interactions, what you quickly realize is that the answer depends the, the, whether the interaction is, is a positive, net positive or net negative, that answer depends on the orientation of the ion, the point, di, the point charge with respect to the dipole moment. So I, I, I list three situations here to try to indicate to you how that comes about, right? So if you recall, the dipole moment uh, points from a negative to a positive in the molecule. So in this particular case, the arrow P indicates that the direction of the arrow P indicates that the positive end of the molecule in, is, is closest to the positive point charge plus Q. This is indicated by that, uh, in that uh, orange light orange box at the at the top top left of the slide, so that interaction potential energy because is going to be a, a a maximum right the the molecule is actually going to be repelled from the ion because of the orientation of the charge within the dipole moment interacts is that interaction is not favorable with respect to the uh, uh, ion charge. Conversely, if you take the ion and you move it to the uh, left side of the dipole, right, you maintain the same position of the dipole moment, right, you consider the interaction potential energy of this situation, what you'll find is that the interaction potential energy is a negative, it's, it's a, I'm sorry, it's a minimum, and that's simply because now the positive ion plus Q is interacting more strongly with the negative end of the molecule, right? Produces a minimum in potential energy. And then the third case that's easy to consider is the situation in which the positive ion Q is located directly above the, uh, the dipole moment P. In this situation, the interaction potential energy, if you calculate it, is, is precisely zero. So how the ion is oriented with respect to the molecule determines the, uh, the, uh, the sign of U of Z uh, in a way that I hope is uh, reasonably easy to, to sort out based on the formulas that were given earlier in the lecture. If you want an exact formula uh, for uh, uh, the interaction potential energy of a point charge with a dipole, uh, I, I actually work out the, uh, the relevant arithmetic here. Uh, the important uh, final result is the case that's, uh, uh, is, is the equation that's boxed in red. That, that's the result of after doing all the algebra. And it basically says that the, um, the interaction potential energy between a point charge Q and a dipole moment P 
varies as 1 over z squared, where z is the distance uh, between the uh, point charge and the dipole. So this is interesting because if you recall, the interaction potential energy between two point charges varied as 1 over z. When you substitute a dipole for one of the point charges, the interaction potential energy varies now as 1 over z squared. The orientation dependence that we discussed qualitatively on the previous slide is now indicated by that factor cosine theta in the, uh, in the red box. So depending on uh, where your angle theta is, where, where the point charge is with respect to the dipole, that defines the angle theta as indicated uh, in the diagram on the right-hand side of this slide. Depending on what that angle theta is, you're going to get either a positive or negative sign for the uh, electrostatic potential energy. So that's a, it's a, it's a very simple result. Uh, I think the algebra is straightforward enough that everyone can follow it. Uh, the key point here is that uh, the, the nature of the interaction is going to depend on orientation now. This is something that, that perhaps wasn't the, the case when we just considered two point charges. For two point charges, it doesn't matter how they're oriented. As long as their separation is fixed, you'll get the same interaction potential energy. When you start to consider interactions between charges and dipoles, it turns out that the orientation becomes an important uh, factor, and that's, that's what this simple example is, is trying to emphasize to you. So here I actually work out, uh, I put in some numbers, just, just uh, uh, for those of you that may not be familiar with the set of units that we're using, uh, is sort of a standard setup problem where I've, I, I define the dipole moment uh, to be one to buy, um, uh, let's see, the point charge Q uh, in this case was one electron and the intervening medium between the dipole moment and the point charge is a dielectric uh, with the dielectric constant cap equal to two. And I just work out the, uh, the numbers and the, the, uh, the consequence, right, the important consequence of the fact that the interaction potential energy now varies as one over Z squared is that the interaction potential energy for this case is about 100 to 200 times smaller than the uh, equivalent interaction potential energy between two, two point charges separated by the same distance. So that 1 over z squared really reduces the interaction uh, potential energy. It just means that the interaction between the ion and the, and the dipole moment is, is much weaker than, uh, than you might might expect uh, based on, uh, you know, the, the interaction between two point charges. So, uh, this discussion sort of begs the question, right, if, if this ion-dipole interaction depends on angle, depends on the position, the relative orientation of the dipole with respect to the point charge, uh, um, and if the dipole, if the molecule that has the dipole moment is free to rotate in space, how do we take into account the fact uh, of this of this rotation? How do we basically how do we angle how do we angle average this interaction over all angles so that we get some average interaction that that we can then use to discuss uh, uh, these these interaction potentials and, and also the interaction forces? So. In the next lecture, we're going to discuss in some detail how we do the angle average and uh, the proper mathematics required to, to, to pull that off. And so uh, for lecture four, that will be the, the topic that we'll discuss in more detail. So until the next lecture, we'll, we'll see you uh, later.